Well, good morning. Welcome to the Laboratory uh, LOINC workshop and committee meeting. Uh, and welcome to Indianapolis. My name is uh, Daniel Vreeman. I'm the director of LOINC and Health Data Standards. And uh, I'm really excited to have all of you joining us. I'd like to begin by just kind of starting with why we're here in the first place. Why does LOINC exist? Why are you interested in it? And uh, today, you hear a lot about the word uh, interoperability, or the lack thereof in health IT applications. And I put this graphic up at the beginning just to sort of remind us why we care about it, right? We're interested in the interoperability of health IT systems because we care about making health care and health better for all kinds of people. Uh, and so at the core of it, what we're trying to do is get the right information to the right person at the right time, whether that's a provider caring for a patient, uh, whether that's directly to the patient themselves or to other state public health reporting agencies. The context of exchanging data between different parties is why uh, interoperability matters in healthcare. And I won't go into, I'll, I'll, I won't steal all of Jim's thunder. Uh, I'll lead, though, with a, with a brief definition of what interoperability is, and, and just to make sure we're actually sort of in the ballpark of on the same page with this. So when I say interoperability, what do I mean? I mean the ability of a health IT system or application to communicate, uh, exchange data, and then to be able to actually use the data that has been exchanged. Um, and Jim will probably mention the different levels of interoperability, but that's the idea. We're trying to not just dump data from one place to another, we're actually trying to make use of it uh, in the context of uh, health. And these days you'll hear a lot about uh, interoperability. It's recognized as a big challenge, uh, certainly within the United States. This is a quote from uh, uh, the current HHS secretary just from the end of April. Uh, he, he says, you know, interoperability and the free flow of data are absolutely crucial, absolutely, says again, absolutely crucial to making the benefits as big as possible for our system and making sure we're helping as many patients as we can. And certainly this is not just a U.S. problem, this is a, um, a, a worldwide problem of trying to uh, liberate data and make it available when and where it's needed. And so if you hear or pay attention to any of the uh, sort of initiatives, the big initiatives that get talked about today, these very issues are sort of at the core of it. So when you hear about precision medicine, which generally speaking would be being able to deliver care that accounts for individual differences in people's genes, the environments that they're in, and their lifestyles. In order to be able to do that, you have to be able to incorporate many different types of data that are generated and stored in many different places and formats, meaning you need lots of different systems to be able to uh, integrate or interoperate uh, with each other. Likewise, uh, you might have heard of sort of the cancer moonshot and lots of uh, activity here within the U.S. focusing on um, accelerating uh, advancements in um, our ability to treat cancer. And so this was a, a, a recent report from the, uh, the President's Cancer Panel. And it's not sort of, it's not surprising to me, but it might be to, to others in the healthcare field that their number one objective was to enable interoperability uh, because that they saw as one of the biggest barriers um, to being able to improve cancer related outcomes uh, through connected health. And so why? Because they want to be able to support care delivery across the cancer continuum from prevention all the way through treatment, survivorship, and end of life care. So getting systems to talk to each other getting the data to flow where it's needed is all part of accomplishing that vision. But the reality is that too often, patients actually move faster and further than their health information does. Um, you know, the patient moving around the healthcare system is outpacing the ability of the data to go with them. Uh, and that is essentially the problem that we, us, collectively are trying to solve uh, with data standards. Um, and so we're trying to tame this wicked problem, uh, which is, is a difficult problem of uh, interoperability among health IT systems. And it's the reason, uh, despite the fact that it's sort of recent news and, and is common, commonly discussed now, it's the reason that uh, Clem got into this uh, space uh, very, very early on. And so I'll share a little bit about uh, how Loink came to be our superhero origin story, which starts with uh, Clem uh, McDonald, who came to the Reagan Street Institute in the early 1970s and started working on 
um, computerized medical record systems. He was one of the first to realize that the power of the computer was, um, was in some ways limited by the scope of information that was available to it. And the more that you could bring into the purview of the information system, the better the computer could help the clinician. And so in the mid-90s, he started um, realizing and started working towards piecing together multiple different computer systems, not just the office practice system or the inpatient hospital system, but trying to get lots of different uh, systems to talk to each other. And so he described the vision that we're still working to attain as canopy computing. And in a really great uh, article published in uh, 98 in JAMA, he talked about uh, canopy computing as being uh, this idea of letting health IT applications function as sort of an ecosystem like the rainforest canopy. So the rainforest canopy, of course, is this, as he says, seamless web through which arboreal creatures efficiently move to reach the edible fruits without any attention to the individual trees. And so that's the type of health IT network that we'd like to be able to create, which is one where the data moves without any attention to which system uh, or formats or vendor uh, it, um, it was produced by and just goes where it's needed with, of course, the appropriate protections. But the challenge is that uh, local systems, local producers of health data, all have different ways of identifying the same thing. And uh, this uh, is a great, uh, a great slide from the, the early days, you know, escape from medical data babble, you know, demand informatic standards. Uh, and and because that's the only way to, to overcome this, uh, this uh, tower of babel uh, of information. What you need, of course, is a, a language in which both the sender and receiver understand what you're talking about. And so in the, in the early, um, the initial paper on Moink, uh, the, the author sort of phrased it like this. You know, this problem, that is, different systems identifying the same thing in different ways, uh, wouldn't exist at all if the data producers use the same universal set of test identifiers when they're electronically uh, transmitting test results. And this idea, uh, because in the mid-90s, there was no such appropriate standard, um, the idea with Moink, of course, is to become, to be that universal standard for identifying health measurements, observations, uh, and documents. And it was established in uh, 1994 uh, by, by Clem and the gang. Um, uh, who uh, have continued to uh, be active and, and um, what started early on uh, has grown into um, uh, a, a standard that's now being used around, uh, around the world. But it started with a, with a very real problem of trying to connect um, independent health information systems. So today the team at Reagan Street is the, sort of the overall steward for the LOINC uh, SDO. Uh, and I like to say it's a small team that does uh, big things. So you can see uh, current uh, registry of staff members who are working on LOINC uh, pictured here. And uh, for those of you in the room, uh, you'll, you'll notice uh, them with these uh, orange goldish uh, color uh, lanyards. So why don't you all raise your hand a second, people can turn around and see where you're at. So thank you. Um, they, of course, are the ones who made this meeting uh, possible. So big thanks uh, to them. Uh, in addition, we have the help of many of you, uh, and uh, the LOINC committee uh, in particular as our, our advisory body, both the laboratory and clinical group, and our, our, our budding uh, radiology group, as well as members of the LOINC committee who, uh, community who continue to advance the standard by making term requests, by providing uh, translations into other languages, by serving as advocates and enthusiasts in lots of different roles. Um, we are greatly appreciated of the large community that's helping to propel LOINC forward. We're supported financially uh, by a number of different sources. I've listed here on the slide uh, the, the collection of organizations that have contributed uh, to LOINC's development over its 20 plus year history. Um, of course, of notable mention is the, the U.S. National Library of Medicine, which has uh, funded LOINC essentially from uh, the beginning and today accounts for about two thirds uh, of our funding, as well as uh, support from the Reagan Street Institute and the, the collection of folks that you, uh, you see here. Yeah. But as we started uh, 
building a terminology standard around uh, tests and measurements, we, uh, we did it with a particular view. And you'll see this uh, sort of played out. Well, today is how I talk about Link, and tomorrow as we, as we uh, discuss current things that are happening. Um, but, a, but a couple of sort of uh, themes of how we view the world. So one is um, that uh, in, in the standard space, collaboration beats uh, competition. So you'll see lots of um, areas where we're working together with other groups um, to uh, tackle this big problem of interoperability. You'll see uh, our focus on incremental iterations, uh, meaning uh, learning from, uh, from where we are and where we're going sort of step by step and uh, development or advancement of the standard driven by uh, community inputs uh, and requests. We've also sort of taken the approach that uh, we, we want going to be successful in the way that it would become successful is if lots of people use it. And so we want to try to keep the barriers to entry, the barriers to participation as low as possible. And one of those, of course, is just um, uh, cost. And so uh, Loink is made available for free. I like to say it's free uh, but invaluable, meaning the contribution it makes is invaluable, but uh, to get it, you don't have to pay any money. Uh, and its goal, really, if I had to sort of sum it up in, in, a, in a short sentence, Loink's uh, purpose is to make health data more portable and understandable to different computer systems. So if this is your first time and you're <laughs> just here because you heard Loink and you're like, I have no idea what it is, and your friend asks you on the street when you leave here today or when you call home or whatever, uh, remember this. You know, this is the sort of take home message. What is Loink all about? Its goal is to make data uh, portable and understandable to different computer systems. And of course, uh, while it sounds in some ways crazy, uh, our vision is that Loink is used essentially in every uh, clinical information system that needs to share or aggregate data because that unlocks the power um, of uh, health IT applications for understanding and making use of that data. So the end that we have in mind, that is, if, if this thing, if, if um, health IT standards are wildly successful, what, what do we accomplish? Well, um, we accomplish having systems that integrate data with high fidelity, meaning as uh, information is moved from one to the other, we're not losing, uh, we're not losing fidelity. Uh, we're not degrading the information. You, you have an ecosystem where data exists when and where you need it, and you have computers that can help understand the content and uh, make use of it, um, because that, we believe, enables lots of transformative things. Loink's focus uh, as a terminology uh, standard is on one particular area of the overall interoperability puzzle. So uh, you need other standards, but it's important to understand how Loink fits into this picture. Our focus is tests, measurements, and uh, collections thereof. We largely think about the world divided into two categories. And while uh, the Loink database is all Loink, there's sort of two, um, two areas you can think about. Uh, the first is laboratory Loink. And this uh, is essentially the set of things that you can test, measure, or observe on a specimen. And in that context, uh, you'll see uh, um, codes that exist in all of the sort of usual clinical laboratory categories. Uh, this wordle uh, illustrates sort of the relative proportion of the number of codes we have in each of these different uh, classes. And you'll see things uh, like microbiology, chemistry, drug tox, uh, and so forth. This uh, shows you just briefly the top 10 uh, sort of domains uh, currently uh, in Loink by number of, uh, uh, this number of active codes. And so you see uh, micro and, and chem and drug tox sort of up at the top and, and uh, on, uh, on down the list. So that's sort of the laboratory side. The other side that we think about is clinical, which is more or less everything else. Uh, but specifically, you might say that clinical Loink is a set of Loink codes that focus on uh, measurements that you can make about a patient uh, or a population without like, actually extracting or removing something from them. So uh, it's made as sort of the person as a whole or the body part. And uh, here you see a, a few categories that stand out just from the number, the sheer number of codes that we have. And then actually there's lots of sort of smaller pockets. Um, but some of the big areas are um, sort of standardized patient assessment instruments, survey instruments, or standardized uh, clinician uh, evaluated things, uh, radiology reports, 
um, document codes, um, but it, it goes on down the list. Ophthalmology, measurements, uh, stuff you'd make, measurements you'd make on uh, ultrasound or um, history and physical, vital signs, and so forth. Essentially, LOINC currently, uh, actually I forgot to update this, we're at 84 uh, plus thousand codes, but it's really a rich trove of standardized variables that span a wide variety of different contexts. And so today, uh, and in this meeting, we're largely focused on the laboratory domain, but I think it's important for you to understand sort of the breadth of content that is in uh, LOINC and continues to be adding. And so there's variables re related to um, uh, testing and measuring uh, clinical genetics, uh, laboratory and clinical measurements, but there's also lifestyle uh, variables and uh, environmental variables here. And I just you know, put a few different examples of things in here, but in the clinical context, uh, essentially anything that you can test or measure, observe, which might be about uh, the patient or a sample of the patient, but it might also be about the environment that they're in, that's sort of all within scope uh, for what LOINC is, uh, is geared up to do. So you'll, you'll often hear LOINC talked about in this, uh, this way of sort of questions and answers or observations and observation values. So I wanted to sort of use this as an illustration for um, how LOINC fits into the overall picture of storing and representing health data. So if you think of an observation as a question and the observation value is the answer to that question. In general, one's primary mission is to provide codes that identify questions. And in general, where needed, we leave it up to or uh, uh, defer to other vocabularies to provide codes for the answers. And so those, in different contexts, those answers might come from ICD or from SNOMED, CT, for example, um, or they might be, um, sort of syntax related things, if you're thinking of uh, ISCN or HDBS syntax for uh, genetic um, variants and so forth. Um, but our primary business is focused on questions. And so, say in a laboratory context, in your head you might think a question like, you know, does my patient have HIV? And that's represented as a particular test. Uh, in this case, it's sort of a present, the test for um, uh, HIV represented as presence absence. Um, you might also think of a question more in the lines of, okay, is, is my HIV patient's immune system responding well to ART? And here you're thinking, you know, in your head about a CD4 count uh, measurement, and this too is represented by a particular uh, uh, code in LOINC. But from the clinical context, you might think of a question like, well, how fast does my patient usually walk? So that too can be represented in the same way with a, a code in a standardized name that's describing, say, a one-week average walking speed. It's a quantitative measurement that represents that particular uh, question. And so, uh, Loink's purpose in identifying these questions or observations fits into this context of how you might use other kinds of, of data standards. And this, of course, is a, a very large topic that we won't have time to cover today, but I want to just illustrate a few things. So, Many of you are familiar with the HL7 messaging uh, exchange standard. And here is a little snippet uh, of a ORU message, specifically the OBX segment, which is the line um, for uh, reporting and observation. And you, you can see, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with HL7, it's a, a, a vertical bar uh, delimited uh, uh, sort of text representation where each a uh, pair of vertical bars sort of delineates a, a field that has a, that's expecting a, a certain type of information. And so in this little extract here, the NM there says, oh, this particular observation, this OBX, uh, is going to have a numeric value as the answer. And uh, so that value has a particular slot uh, in there, uh, and it's also associated with units of measure, but the, the job of identifying, well, what measurement is this, what test is this, is fulfilled by the LOINC code, which has a position in the message. And so you can see the code, the LOINC code there, um, uh, a name, and then the identifier for that. But exactly the same paradigm exists in lots of different formats. So you, you hear about HL7 version two messages, you might hear about HL7 CDA or clinical document architecture documents, which are XML representations, or currently the, the, the rage is, is Fire, which is an application programming interface. 
um, which can be expressed in, in JSON or, or XML. Um, and so the format of that exchange in some ways doesn't matter. They're all using that same paradigm, which is an observation and, and needing a way to identify what this thing is and then having a place or a structure for storing the value. Um, and so Loink works perfectly well uh, in all of those contexts where you have this sort of uh, name value pair or entity attribute value or observation observation value. Those are all the same ways as saying the same thing. Uh, it works equally well in all of those different uh, contexts. So I showed you first, you know, an example where the, the result was a number, and so you pair that with a unit of measure, you're good to go. Of course, other kinds of observations, the answer or the value uh, might be coded. And so here's another example, sort of of the same uh, flavor. This is an HL7 uh, version two uh, OBX segment snippet. And here the CE is saying, oh, the value is going to be a, a coded element. And uh, you know, the first slot there is still the observation identifier. You see the link code there, and it's saying, ah, oh, this is a blood culture. Mm -hmm. And the code there comes from link. That's what the LN stands for. But then further on down the row in OBX5, you see a code uh, coming from uh, SNOMED, which is indicating the um, uh, the organism or the value of what was found uh, in this culture. And so here you see um, an illustration of sort of the classic example of using uh, Loink as a, as a question identifier, SNOMED CT as an answer identifier, all in the context of an HL7 uh, exchange. So Loink is primarily focused on, I've been using these examples for codes that represent individual observations. Um, but uh, we also create codes that represent uh, collections of observations. And depending on your domain, you might call that a panel or a battery or uh, a data set or a form, a collection where you're, you have an enumerated set of uh, observations inside is also um, something that, uh, that Loink creates. Now you might be thinking, oh man, this standard stuff sounds great. But I love maintaining my own local dictionary. Uh, what will happen to my precious codes if I adopt the standard, right? Um, I don't know if any of you actually think that or not. Uh, but you can relax because uh, in the context of all of these sort of exchange standards that I've been talking about, uh, you can send both your local code and the standard code sort of side by side. Meaning uh, for all of the things that local codes are good at, meaning having a particular meaning in a particular context that's sort of tailored to uh, what the users are expecting and what they like to see on their displays and all of that, the decision rules and the workflows that you built around them, you can still have that, but in the context of the standard, what you want to achieve interoperability is this more universal uh, representation. Um, and so sending both of them together is the, the sort of recommended approach um, and uh, is uh, in, in, for example, the implementation guides around HL7, what's, what's, uh, what's recommended. So don't worry, you don't have to give up your local codes. All right, uh, before I move on to the next thing, you might be wondering, especially for those of you here in the room looking at these wonderful uh, outlet things, what's with the pig? <clears throat> uh, so essentially, it's just for fun. Uh, the pig is our unofficial, <laughs> official mascot. Uh, because Loink sounds like Loink, uh, and so why not, right? Um, I will have you know that these uh, cool adapter little things have RFIDs on them, and huge alarm bells will sound off if you try to sneak them into your luggage on the way home. <laughs> not exactly, but sorry, you can't, uh, you can't take them, because we want to use them next time. But. So you might see a few different uh, pig references uh, throughout the day, and it's just uh, our Midwest roots having, uh, having fun. So Loink uh, sort of started uh, 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 back in the mid-90s, and as I mentioned, it's, it's sort of grown here at the Reagan Street Institute uh, in Indiana, where you um, are visiting. Uh, but today it serves a much uh, broader community, a very broad community, that includes um, lots of different participants. And so currently, Loink is available in 18 uh, variants of 12 different languages, thanks to um, the support of uh, many extremely dedicated volunteers uh, who take on this work, um, uh, each release to keep things updated and so forth. Today there are about 47,000 uh, registered Loink users that come from uh, 166 different countries. 
And uh, the map here shows you uh, countries where there is a registered Boink user. And uh, in general, we're averaging about 6,000 or so uh, new registered users uh, each year. But uh, registered users uh, come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And so um, Boink users can be uh, large referral or reference laboratories or radiology centers, health-related federal agencies, individual care organizations, health information exchange networks, professional societies, insurance companies, app developers, um, instrument manufacturers, uh, and so forth. And so there isn't sort of a one-size-fits-all type of Link user. Um, there's lots of different kinds. Link has been adopted as uh, and implemented as a official national standard in more than uh, 30 countries. And so to make it onto this list, um, uh, I need to have found, you know, demonstrated evidence that a national level program like the Ministry of Health or something has uh, adopted uh, LOINC as a standard that it wants to use. Doesn't necessarily, this list of 30 doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, absolutely mandated in some cases, but it's an official proclamation that, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to use LOINC. And I wanted to just give sort of a small taste of what LOINC adoption and use uh, looks like uh, around the world. Um, as a sort of a brief tour to let you know um, who all is is uh, is using it, just a small flavor. So um, late uh, last summer, um, uh, a paper came out in the International Journal of uh, Medical Informatics describing uh, implementation of a uh, open source limb system in Vietnam that was implemented in 38 hospitals, public health and HIV testing laboratories. And uh, as part of this open source strategy, they mapped uh, the, 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 the tests in these um, limb systems to LOINC in order to facilitate uh, data exchange and interoperability projects. Um, the Austrian National Patient Health Record um, has been uh, developing over the last couple of years, and they have adopted uh, LOINC for laboratory tests as well as for identifying documents and sections. And um, there's a nice paper uh, that I've shown here that describes sort of the approach to terminology management in Austria. And they use a, a subset of LOINC codes um, for uh, sort of this, for use in this um, uh, national uh, patient record focused on the ones that are, are performed in um, in Austria, and that list is maintained and updated in coordination with the lab community there. Uh, NICTIS, which is the uh, National um, ICT uh, Institute of the Netherlands, has a number of different national projects cooking uh, that are using LOINC. So there's a nationwide surveillance network for bacterial typing and antibiotic uh, resistance surveillance. There's a uh, national lab code list that's um, curated by two of the professional societies, and they also have uh, uh, a national special test registry which helps um, uh, collect and organize what labs are doing what tests, and it's all organized by, uh, by LOINC code. Um, and they've, uh, Nixus has become a, uh, a LOINC uh, a premium member, and uh, uh, many of our colleagues in the Netherlands are active uh, submitters of requests for new content as well. So there's, a, there's an initiative um, that uh, is sort of, a, I guess, maybe a third generation project, sort of with heritage from a, a project called EPSOS and sort of Trillium Bridge uh, before it. This is um, happening primarily in HL7 in coordination with, uh, with other standards group, such as SEND TC215. But essentially, the idea is to create an international uh, patient summary, which is a, a non exhaustive summary of patients that's specialty agnostic condition independent, but usable by clinicians for the purpose of cross-border unscheduled care. Uh, and inside of this uh, project, they're using uh, uh, so CDA as the primary exchange uh, uh, technology, uh, but th they've adopted link codes for documents, sections, lab results, and other kinds of uh, clinical observations, including uh, radiology reports. A paper uh, last year also came out describing uh, the use of RELMA to map um, local uh, Russian laboratory terms to LOINC codes. And uh, I, I included this uh, to give you hope for by the end of the day, you'll say, ah, maybe I too can say uh, that this is true. 
Uh, so their experience in, in mapping, actually in using the translation uh, part of Rama, was that uh, the, the required effort is reasonable uh, and the, the price of mapping and maintenance relatively low. So overall, they, they were satisfied with using the tool uh, for the job they uh, were trying to get done. The Ministry of Health uh, in Brazil has been a longtime uh, supporter of LOINC. They've, um, they've officially adopted LOINC as of, I think, 2011 as being uh, required for laboratory test reporting. Um, but even preceding that, there's a large regional health information exchange project um, in Sao Paulo that's been um, using LOINC for, to exchange data for, for many, many years. And uh, the uh, HL7 um, Brazil uh, affiliate has been the, the organizers of the Portuguese uh, link translation. In Thailand, the Thai Health Information Standards Development Center has been um, uh, promoters of LOINC and um, its use uh, within Thailand uh, over the course of, say, the last uh, five to seven years or so. And um, recently, this was, uh, I think, the end of last year, sometime recently, uh, came out with a, an overall report and set of recommendations around um, uh, e-health e in Thailand with a big focus uh, on uh, LOINC. And inside of this report contains a couple of studies where they summarize the you know, content coverage, just LOINC cover of the tests that we are interested in and so forth. And overall, they summarized that, uh, that adopting LOINC will facilitate the EHR interoperability uh, in Thailand. In Saudi Arabia, I, I, I selected this one as an as a interesting example because um, it is from the sort of insurance side. And so the, um, the, in Saudi Arabia, the, the Council of Cooperative Health Insurance uh, is trying to um, essentially create uh, a program that covers everyone uh, in Saudi Arabia, including those who are uh, not citizens but working uh, there to have uh, uh, health care and insurance, and are building this thing that they call um, the Saudi Health Insurance Bus, which is to facilitate information exchange between the various stakeholders, including um, uh, companies, health providers, beneficiaries, and so forth. And inside of this uh, exchange uh, program, they've adopted LOINC for uh, lab orders and results. And uh, the last example I'll use here just to sort of give you a sampling of what's happening around the world is the Turkish Ministry of Health. Uh, which has been engaged in LOINC for a number of years. They've been uh, producing a Turkish translation of LOINC and mapping, uh, providing a mapping of LOINC to the national billing codes to help um, uh, facilitate adoption. But uh, just earlier this year, I believe it was in April, the, uh, the General Directorate of Health Services recently mandated uh, LOINC for laboratory results in uh, public university and, and uh, private uh, health facilities. And honestly, we could spend all day talking about um, the fun things that are happening um, as people use LOINC around the world. Um, I just wanted to give a, a brief sample of that, um, and, uh, but know that there's, there's a long story there. For those of you coming from and, and tuning into this because of uh, the, the, your, your role in the US, I'll just sort of mention also a few highlights from, from here. So obviously, uh, the Meaningful Use Program certification and so forth uh, has been a big driver of what's happening in health IT in the US. Um, the 2015 edition here had lots of different mentions of LOINC uh, and uh, certainly that is um, an accelerator of interest in LOINC uh, within the US. The Office of the National Coordinator publishes a document that they call the Interoperability Standards Advisory and it's um, sort of ONC's uh, list of standards recommended or uh, fit for purpose for various interoperability needs. And uh, this document has gone through a couple of different iterations. It's published annually. The most recent one uh, that uh, came out uh, named LOINC for lots of different things. And so uh, the different, uh, what they call interoperability needs, where LOINC is identified, spans some things that you might be quite familiar with, for example, representing laboratory tests, uh, but actually sort of exposes the, the breadth of one content and representation in a lot of different areas, so radiology or imaging studies, um, social determinants of health, 
uh, uh, other kinds of observations uh, as, uh, as well. We're going to talk more about this uh, tomorrow, but there's been uh, a great deal of interest and support um, from the FDA in trying to advance lab uh, test data interoperability. And uh, one of the, um, one of the sort of parts of, uh, of FDA um, has, uh, has uh, noted that Splunk will be required as um, the identifier for laboratory uh, tests in uh, clinical trials reported to FDA starting after March uh, 2018. Uh, so in the clinical trial realm, this is um, uh, a, a, a step forward, but a, um, uh, an important um, you know, advancement for interoperability. Um, and is, is part of the reason why um, I think some of you are tuning in today to learn more about, more about LOINC. The FDA has also been uh, facilitating uh, actively uh, discussion with the IBD vendor community about um, ways to identify which LOINC codes go with the products that these um, uh, manufacturers and vendors um, uh, produce, with the idea being that uh, at uh, customers or purchasers of these IVD um, uh, products, if they had in hand the listing of the, the local, the, the manufacturer's codes, the transmission codes, uh, with one codes, that would massively simplify and accelerate the process of using and incorporating the standard codes. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, a lot of excitement is happening there and you're going to hear more about that uh, tomorrow. In addition, uh, we've been working very closely with uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, in particular around their uh, patient assessment instruments. Uh, so yes, this is on sort of the clinical side, but it's an important area because um, there's, uh, CMS is mandated by uh, the IMPACT Act, uh, which is sort of propelling them to unify the, the patient assessments that are performed in various post-acute care settings. So this is like um, home care, uh, inpatient rehab, um, skilled nursing facilities, and so forth. And we're working together with them to represent, to create a representation of uh, all the assessment instruments that they require in those settings uh, in LOINC. And along their goal of unifying the way that those assessments are done, the actual data elements, the actual questions uh, that are asked in those different settings. Right now, they're all different. Uh, but there's a goal towards uh, unifying that collection. Uh, so we've been working closely together uh, with them. And uh, Sarah uh, is the, the sort of point person on uh, anything CMS and LOINC. So if you are in that area, she'll answer your questions. <laughs> um, of course, I want to mention the CDC, who's been longtime users of LOINC in lots of different projects. Um, so you've got uh, electronic laboratory reporting, case reporting, the reportable condition mapping table, as well as other um, sort of uh, national registry-like things. So the, the NEMSIS system, the National Emergency Medical Services Information System, or the National Trauma Data Standards um, are all uh, activities from the CDC that are, uh, that are using LOINC in, in one way or another. And for example, uh, as, uh, as the, the Zika virus um, uh, interest and in testing evolved over time. We worked closely with CDC to help represent what those uh, what those tests were, which of course is part of driving uh, the the care uh, workflow and care decision making process. And so uh, we worked closely with them to identify uh, loin codes for these tests, and they sort of were publishing uh, this um, in order to help laboratories. Uh, be able to identify and, and use sort of the same language to communicate what, uh, what tests were being performed. Uh, last, uh, every time I look, there are, there are jobs that mention LOINC, so um, you're learning a valuable marketable skill by being here, uh, and uh, you, probably, you probably know that, uh, but it's, uh, it's fun to sort of poke around and see uh, this as sort of a required competency in a lot of different things. And uh, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have an iPhone? Here? Okay. All right. So you're also using LOINC. You, if you ever use the Health app, you didn't. Uh, you maybe didn't even know you were using LOINC in this context. Uh, but if you sort of go in there and you put your height and weight in, uh, even something as simple as that, and then you go to export that data, 
uh, it actually inside can spit out a, um, a HL7 CDA document that has standard codes uh, inside of it. Um, and so here's uh, one representing um, uh, a body height. So last, uh, as far as sort of uh, cooking adoption things that I wanted to mention is this trend uh, that I mentioned the FDA was interested in sort of stirring up, but it's really a, a, a broader trend than just the FDA. It's an industry-wide thing, which is the idea of sort of moving standardization further upstream. And uh, so if you're an um, in office practice, upstream from you is the laboratory. And so you'd like to receive the data standardized already, so you don't have to do that mapping work. Uh, of course, if you're the laboratory upstream from you might be the, the test manufacturers from whom you purchased uh, the equipment. And so that's sort of this trend is sort of thinking in all these different dimensions, how can we move that standardization as far upstream so that everybody downstream can benefit from it. Uh, and just as some uh, a quick sampling of examples, a lot of the, um, the largest uh, test manufacturers of lab tests are making available um, the, the mappings or the associations between uh, their tests and loin codes. And so, for example, if you go to the Roche sites and your customer, you can uh, download these technical specs uh, that have the loin codes listed for these different instruments. Um, and, e and some even are going as far, this is an example from, uh, from Bayer Miro, um, who, are, uh, who are sort of actively involved in uh, both the IHE law profile and identifying loin codes for their instruments. And, um, and so sort of getting this in place at the level of the instrument or as close into that uh, flow as possible um, certainly is a benefit for uh, efficiency and also uh, just reducing the variability in mapping um, by having it done sort of at a central uh, reliable source. So, um, so that's a quick sampling of sort of who's using LOIC, how, uh, and so forth. I mentioned at the beginning, you know, this idea that we approach standardization with a view that uh, collaboration is better than competition. And I wanted to just briefly mention a few of the different ways, uh, groups that we're, we're collaborating with. And so you're going to hear more on this uh, tomorrow. It's in the theme of what we were just talking about, um, the IVD manufacturers uh, um, identifying and publishing uh, loin codes connected to their, uh, their tests. Um, but we've been working with the IICC as in their development of a sort of a standard specification for how manufacturers could publish and distribute those, those mappings, those associations. Um, and uh, we'll hear, hear about that from the IACC uh, tomorrow. So stick around. Of course, I've mentioned many times HL7, and uh, we have a, um, an agreement. We've, we've, we've been working closely with HL7 essentially since the beginning. Uh, shares a common heritage, uh, many members um, uh, contributing actively to both uh, parts, and we have an ongoing um, uh, MOU or Statement of Understanding for collaborative work uh, with HL7 that um, is an extremely valuable uh, partnership. We have also an MOU with IEEE uh, to represent their uh, 11073 standards, uh, which are standards about interoperable communications between um, uh, coming out of, say, medical devices and personal health devices. So this includes things like in the ICU and fusion pumps and so forth, but also like home glucose monitors and so forth. So the 11073 suite of standards uh, cover many of those different kinds of devices. And uh, as, they, as those standards are being actively updated, we're working together with them to publish um, a connection uh, between uh, the, the codes that they've been using in those standards and LOINC codes. And that's actually part of the, uh, the official LOINC release in the IEEE, the LOINC IEEE medical device mapping code table. Uh, in 2013, we embarked on a, uh, the beginning of a, of a journey with um, uh, SNOMED, where we had a sort of an official, um, really a landmark uh, agreement for cooperative development, um, preceded by lots and lots of active discussions. <laughs> um, but uh, since then, um, actively working together, uh, both organizations are publishing uh, artifacts that contain connections between LOINC and SNOMED CT, and you'll find those um, both in the distribution of SNOMED uh, and also in the LOINC, uh, the LOINC distribution. 
we have an active uh, agreement and partnership with the uh, Radiologic Society of North America to create a unified model for naming radiology procedures. So previously, RCNA had developed a terminology called uh, the Radlex Playbook, and Loink had been representing radiology procedures for uh, a number of years, and we've agreed to unify our models to essentially have one uh, and uh, have an agreement in place that we're actively working on, and by the, this fall, we'll have completed the unification sort of for everything, and we'll transition into a uh, sort of a maintenance mode, working together uh, hand in hand. Um, but uh, in the LOINC distribution, uh, you'll see this artifact that's the LOINC RSNA radiology playbook file. And the way that we've unified is essentially the LOINC, in some ways, model similar to the SNOMED agreement, uh, where the LOINC code serves as the primary identifier for the, the procedure, um, but the elements that make up that name are mapped between link parts and uh, Radlex identifiers so that uh, you can sort of crosswalk between uh, two uh, terminologies. And uh, we're uh, excited about that and um, have, have worked together closely with them. So uh, you might say that uh, everyone uh, just loves Link. <laughs> So let me give you a quick tour of um, uh, what is actually included in the standard. So to, up to this point, I've been talking uh, primarily about you know, use and adoption and what LOINC's purpose is. But let me give you a quick sampling uh, or overview of what, uh, what is in LOINC. So when we say a LOINC release or a LOINC distribution, it actually includes lots of different things. And so, um, the, so the primary thing, the, the main artifact, of course, is the table, the database, which is you know, uh, the, the, the main sort of link file. But there's a whole collection of other things, including accessory files, tools, and resources, uh, and so forth, that are sort of wrapped around that core thing. So we publish uh, official releases twice per year um, uh, in uh, June and uh, December. And this graph shows sort of the, the growth in link over time, the number of codes that are in the database over time uh, by each of those uh, releases and so um, you can see we're uh, we're now sort of in the 83, 84,000 uh, code range. In this graph, the the top line is the overall number of codes. The orange portion is the proportion of the database that is uh, laboratory terms, with the blue portion uh, being uh, the uh, the proportion that represents clinical things. And so. Uh, today, uh, laboratory terms account for roughly two thirds of the overall number of codes. Um, but uh, you know, depending on the year, you can see sort of the acceleration in the proportion of content uh, that might be coming from uh, from the clinical side. Uh, and so, looking at that graph, uh, you you might have thought, "Gosh, man, you guys have been at this for 20 years. Um, aren't you done yet?" <laughs> and so. Uh, I, like, I like this quote um, from uh, Louis Moore, which said, uh, you know, there's a time, uh, there will come a time when you believe everything is finished, and uh, that will be the beginning. Uh, meaning, uh, there, there really isn't an end, as you can see from, from the graph. There's not really a leveling off or, uh, or a steady state, per se. Um, and that's because uh, there's just a lot of stuff cooking. Um, so uh, essentially, uh, active development or additions to LOINC come from lots and lots of different spheres. And so there's always new lab tests, there's public health uh, things coming in, whether it's emergent issues or case reporting, new document titles. Right now we're seeing lots and lots of interest from sort of patient reported outcomes measures or social determinants. Um, we've got new initiatives such as um, uh, the work with the clinical genomics group in HL7 that's sort of creating new models for representing clinical genomics reports. Uh, and uh, we're, we're working actively on uh, codes to represent structured pathology reporting for cancer with partnerships uh, through collaboration with uh, CAP and the ICCR. Um, and so there's just, there's lots happening. And people are, not only is healthcare advancing, um, people are representing more and more data electronically that maybe previously wasn't, and all of that is generating a need or demand for uh, uh, standard terminology. Because essentially, the terminology is growing because the community of users is asking for uh, content to represent 
the, the data that they have in their <laughs> systems. Um, and uh, so last year, just as an example, we had requests from about 50, uh, from more than 50 organizations uh, coming from uh, 14 uh, countries. I've plotted them here um, uh, as far as the, uh, the number of organizations requesting codes. So the table, which I mentioned is sort of what you might think of as the core artifact, uh, is really sort of the main LOINC uh, database. And uh, this is uh, distributed in a, in a couple formats, a CSV file and an access database. And it's organized sort of one record per term. Uh, so there's the code, there's the structured name, which you're gonna learn about in a second from, uh, from Jim, as well as a number of different other attributes associated with that term, including uh, two different kinds of other display names, the long common name, the short name, uh, class, example units, and, and a whole bunch of other uh, different attributes. Uh, but it's also important, I mean, you, you can think of Loink as codes and structured names, but these other attributes, uh, including rich descriptions, which has been a real active focus of the content development team here for the last um, five to seven years, really, is, is uh, curating and writing um, uh, narrative descriptions that help explain what this test is really measuring and how you might use it. And so inside of, uh, uh, of the standard is actually a real rich encyclopedia for, um, for, uh, for the variables. In addition to that core table, we also publish a whole collection of accessory files that can be thought of as special representations of uh, LOINC content. <coughs> We're not gonna dive into all of these uh, because frankly we don't have time. I've mentioned some of them sort of in passing already uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly highlight a couple of others that I didn't mention. So there's a, a panels and forms file which is a way to represent the collections of um, a top level code. So it's a, an order panel for example and the, the set of elements that it contains as well as connections to, uh, um, to answer lists and so forth. There's a file for our uh, document ontology. There's a multi-axial hierarchy. And then if you stay tuned tomorrow, you're gonna hear about a whole nother set of accessory files that we've got cooking for uh, this coming uh, release. So that's sort of advanced, uh, advanced link content. In, uh, as we wrap up, I wanted to briefly summarize uh, the LOINC uh, licensing model. Uh, again, I'm not uh, a lawyer and I, I don't play one even on the internet. Uh, but I can summarize the high points of the link license. You should read it because it's marvelously written, it's beautiful prose, um, and you'll just love every minute of it. Uh, but let me give you some of the highlights. So um, this is uh, not the summary of the license uh, because there's sort of some subtle points here, right? So one is um, you actually probably want your standard to be copyrighted in some way, uh, if you are interested in knowing that that thing is the actual sort of standard. Um, so protecting its sort of ownership is one thing, but what you sort of care about is the licensing. You know, what, what can I do with this thing if I, if I get it? So from the link license perspective, a couple of key sort of principles. One is uh, it's available at no cost uh, worldwide um, forever. I mean, if you get it today, uh, uh, you can continue to use that thing that you got today for forever going forward. Um, and you're allowed to use LOINC, you can put it in uh, applications, you can put it in messages, you can copy LOINC, you can make a copy and put it on your website if you wanted to, uh, distribute it and so forth for any purpose, uh, whether commercial purposes or non-commercial purposes, but, uh, and there's, there's mechanisms and we encourage translation of essentially any of our artifacts, whether it's um, the, the core table or documentation, um, though we have some, uh, we're th thinking about how we can better support uh, translation of some of this, this broader set of, of artifacts that we're producing. Uh, but we certainly encourage translation into other languages. But the one thing that you really you can't do with LOINC, prohibited by the license, is you can't use the standard itself or really anything that we publish that's part of that package uh, to develop or promulgate a different standard, uh, a different terminology uh, for orders and observations. So you can't take the LOINC file, make your own codes, 
uh, and call it, you know, better vocabulary. <laughs> Um, because that, of course, defeats the whole purpose of having a standard. Um, so the idea is that we use the same way of representing um, this information, and that's, of course, why we're, we're in this game. Uh, so that's sort of a, the, the, the high-level summary. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about uh, that approach and some of the thinking behind it, I put a link to a post I wrote uh, about Ray and Street's approach to licensing link here. Uh, in addition to you know, the table, accessory files, there's a huge toolbox uh, of resources available for implementers. So today's focus, or the rest of today, is going to be focused on the Realma uh, mapping program, how to use that. It's custom made for the job of linking local terms to Boink codes and has workflow built into that. But there's actually a whole set of other tools that you uh, should be aware of as well. So there's an online search application. Many of you have probably found it because it's quite popular, search.link.org. Um, there are uh, community resources such as a user forum, lots of reference material on the website. Um, there's even uh, some other uh, link related uh, software such as um, NLM's, uh, um, actually I gotta update the name here, LHC forms, uh, which is a data capture widget based on the link panel model. Um, we host a, um, a, a Fire vocabulary server for downloading a couple of our key uh, subsets of Woink, uh, and, and even more. In addition, I wanted to mention uh, a, a new resource that came out last year, uh, a book that I wrote called uh, Woink Essentials. And this is an ebook uh, that's available. You can get it if you just type Woink Essentials into Google, uh, you'll find it. Uh, but uh, it really is sort of the first ever step-by-step um, -step guide for trying to get your local codes uh, mapped to line codes. And uh, so what, is it, what does it cover? It covers some of the things that you'll hear today, so basics of link. Uh, but the reason I wrote it was there really wasn't any uh, as good as the link user's guide is, and the Realm of Manual, and even the trainings. There wasn't sort of an end-to-end -end document that sort of walked you through things step-by-step. -step. Uh, and so this includes sort of a framework and techniques for picking out these subtle but important distinctions between link ter terms, like when I get this list of codes and I see five of them, how do I know which one is the one that I need? Um, a roadmap and some, and some guidance for mapping with Realma and uh, best practices for, for link mapping and how to set yourself up uh, for success in the long run. So if you have any questions about uh, what's in here, let me know. Um, there's, a, there's a copy out front that you can leaf through if you want. Um, but I have to disclose, I wrote the book, so I kind of think it's good. Uh, you can think it's crap if you want, or tell me where it should get better. Um, but, uh, so if you, if you buy it, um, I will get a little money, uh, but actually all of it's going to a special charitable project, which you can also read about um, on, uh, on my website. It is guaranteed not to be a New York Times bestseller, so um, the, the audience, of course, is, is uh, quite niche. Um, so. So Link Essentials, uh, Realma, and all the tools there. Uh, but I also want to highlight, uh, as we wrap up here, um, uh, some, some resources that you can uh, take advantage of from us here at Reagan Street. So um, you, from the Link website, you can, you can actually participate and contribute back to this, the Link standard in a couple different ways to help us financially. One is simply by making a donation. Uh, but the thing that I want to uh, highlight right now is our premium membership program. Uh, and uh, so the premium membership program is an annual um, uh, uh, subscription that gives you special benefits uh, and access to a couple of key resources. And I'm going to just highlight uh, two of those things that would encourage you uh, to check out what's available there. Ask any of us uh, on staff here uh, if you have questions. Uh, the two I want to mention, this is uh, the newest thing that we added to that membership program is a monthly uh, webinar series. Uh, we call it Linkinars that, uh, that cover uh, sort of topics of interest, uh, both the users and implementers of Link, giving you uh, sort of behind the scenes access or um, uh, dedicated time with the, the Reagan Street staff. So we've done, uh, we've done two of them so far um, and have had a lot of fun doing it. So we covered. Uh, some details uh, around the life cycle of a submission. How do you request a term? 
what happens when it comes over to Regan Street. Like, if you peek inside uh, the cubicles of uh, the content uh, development team, like, what will you see? Um, and uh, and then sort of you know the the back and flow back and forth that happens there. Uh, we also offered a sneak peek at uh, these new artifacts that are coming in the release. Uh, and so I'm excited about this um, and I think it'll be of great interest and it's part of the, the premium membership uh, package there. But the, the, the other thing that I wanted to highlight uh, that I think is sort of the, 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 the cream of the, the crop here as far as what's in this uh, membership uh, program is the mapping validity checker. And so uh, this is a service available uh, to, to users of the, uh, uh, the LOINC membership program. Uh, I think it's totally worth the cost of membership just by itself. And essentially the idea is what it, what it takes as input. So you send us a file that has uh, your local codes, uh, the names of those tests, units, and your mappings to one codes. And what you get back is a spreadsheet that highlights uh, issues detected by the evaluation process. It's a, it's a handy, relatively quick, inexpensive double check uh, on your mappings. And uh, the kinds of uh, review that, it, that this uh, system provides include things like uh, looking for unknown or weird, uh, potentially wrong or typoed uh, local units, um, flagging duplicated and discouraged terms, cases where you might have mapped something uh, to a link code and there's a mismatch between the units that you have and the property of the link code, or where there's a mismatch between uh, the units for your test and the scale of the link code. Uh, or things where your test looks like a concentration, but the term that you mapped it to has no denominator in it, um, those kinds of things. And so uh, the idea is that the spreadsheet uh, that you get back with these uh, things will help you pinpoint and double check uh, and produce a high, higher, quality, uh, higher quality mapping. And so um, that's uh, part of the, the premium membership program. And uh, I think it's a great value. So that ends my whirlwind tour of uh, uh, Loink.